welcome to Poetry Club. Today is part two of our discussion on two more Rita Dove poems. So let's get started. I'm going to go out on a limb and say we've discussed rusks enough. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah. So last week, I'll go ahead and get started, I guess. So last week, um, we went line by line with Rusk. And what we were doing is playing devil's advocate. Uh, can, does, a, does an award-winning poet, the question was on the table, can an award-winning, multi-award-winning poet write good poetry consistently? Um, you know, it's, uh, and all this week, I've been thinking about um, when is the sweet spot for an artist in general? These, these judgments are so difficult to manage. And, uh, you know, we all, we have different opinions. Uh, you all were really kind about my baseball poem. You were enthusiastic. <laughs> I, I think every other poem I've submitted is a better poem than that baseball poem, but I wouldn't <laughs> hope to convince the rest of you of that. In, in a really famous passage, uh, which probably none of you know about, <laughs> uh, W.H. Auden edited the Viking in book uh, collection of English poetry and 1941. And in the introduction, he said, Tennyson is the stupidest of English poets. <laughs> it was a really damning comment, but it was, it, it, the, the effect was to hold Auden up for some real scrutiny and backlash. Tennyson is nothing else. He may be the most intelligent English poet ever, and he may have written some dumb poetry. He did. But those judgments, they're so, they're so individual. I found reading Rita Dove, she was one of the most challenging poets we've read, trying, <laughs> trying to get a, a toehold in each of the poems uh, and then see how the poems kind of held together, how the dynamics worked. I I appreciated Shannon's um, request that we look at her reading at various events and then her interviews too. I found that was interesting to spend time learning more about her and her process and what was behind some of the poems. Um, as well as reading the interview with Bill Moyers, The Language of Life. I find that she's so rich in so many ways. Her poetry is a pleasure to spend time with. I, I was predisposed to like her because I got to hear her early on and at UPS. So um, I think we were, I think we were in the chapel I don't know, some, some small venue, so it was easy to see her. And her book, Thomas and Beulah, was just, I think those were the two grandparents' names, just about to come out. And so she, she was talking a great deal about her grandparents and giving us snippets of that. Um, <laughs> just because a poet, I hear a poet read doesn't make them better, but it means I, I, lis I listen and read their work then with more sensitivity and caring and because they're my poet then i've heard them what's my point there i come to her work very positively i guess that's that's my thought about rita dove i think that's something that's a by actually a pleasant bias that most of us probably would share <laughs> i think you can also hear their voice when you read their poem which when you're reading it and you already know the voice of the, the voice and the mannerisms of the poet. And, you, and you've heard them not just read the poem, but render Talk it. About it. Yes. 
You know, Robert Frost was careful when he would read poems and say, phrase he would use is, I'll say that one again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> say, right. say is an interesting word choice. Well, it's, yeah, deliberately neutral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So was there a poem um, that we wanted to try to tackle today? Maybe not look at, uh, explore it so, in such detail as we did Rusk. Perhaps we can get, you know, more than one done in today's episode. Not that there's anything wrong with that. If we looked at something like American Smooth, it's one page. It's an ex interesting exploration of dance as metaphor it might be a kind of nice warm up. I like that. That's a great idea. Okay. To the parsley poems. Yeah. Amy, would you like to read it? Uh, yes, you would. Sure, sure. American Smooth. We were dancing. It must have been a fox trot or a waltz, something romantic, but requiring restraint rise and fall, precise execution as we moved into the next song without stopping, two chests heaving above a seven league stride, such perfect agony. One learns to smile through ecstatic mimicry being the sine qua non of American smooth. And because I was distracted by the effort of keeping my frame, the leftward lean head turned just enough to gaze out past your ear and always smiling, smiling. I didn't notice how still you'd become until we had done it for two measures, four achieved flight. That swift and serene magnificence before the earth remembered who we are and brought us down. Mm. <laughs> Just picture that posture uh, from tango and such, where the where the woman is smiling just past the face. Yeah. One of the things that captivated me about this poem is the the synchronicity. Uh, you know, there the things that people do and actually merge their movements. Uh, and their expression. Uh, chorus, we like to think achieves that, but rowing and the boys in the boat uh, uh, asks for perfect synchronization. Mm -hmm. And so the attempt by two individuals to dance together and in harmony and synchronize uh, is a special little human event. She mentions foxtrot or waltz, but I think, like I said quickly at the end of it, I, I think of, of tango and in uh, those South American very erotic dances where the bodies are held so rigid, but it is so sensual. Well, it all the perfect agony. <laughs> mm -hmm. There's some mm -hmm. interesting uh, overstatements in the poem. Above a seven league stride, a league is three miles. Uh, so they're so, moving really fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and wide. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, one learns to smile through ecstatic mimicry and toward the end, that swift and serene magnificence that has to be deliberate hyperbole and it works for me but you know we're talking about when does a poet know that they've done we've talked about this right along that they found the appropriate terms and that they you know it's not just understated but maybe overstated an issue uh she takes a lot of risks that way in this poem I didn't notice how still you'd become until we had done it for two measures for achieve flight. <laughs> Which was beyond the smiling. 
and the physical pain mm -hmm. and the synchronicity. And then she brings us back. I mean, I love the ending. Before the earth remembered who we were and brought us down. And I think it um, works um, to suggest that happiness is just that. It's a flight. Well, think of the pictures, the, think of the movies you've seen of big ballroom dances when they're doing the waltz. Mm -hmm. And particularly when women had long skirts, so you barely saw their feet, they really look like they're off the ground. They're moving so. Yeah, but you it's, know what uh, this reminds me of, though, taking us into, um, into the Olympics right now? This sounds like Simone Biles talking about the agony of having to perform, to always smile, to always be precise, um and indeed she does achieve flight mm -hmm. but the danger of that mm -hmm. i don't know that i would have I, I know i no i know i wouldn't have likened it to gymnastics and if we hadn't been hearing so much from simone and why she had to get out well I, it, I would say she, I mean, she she describes you know uh, something that's choreographed that has I, I just like how she moves from dancing to um, saying that it's supposed to be something that's fun and exciting, but here we are, we're doing this with, um, you know, mimicry and um, American Smooth wouldn't be, uh, a, we wouldn't have American Smooth without this pain that we have to suffer to, to be able to produce it. Um, and then, mm -hmm. then to come back down um, when it's over and then kind of ends it there. I thought this was, a more approachable poem than what we read last week, but I like this one a lot. It, and it's interesting that um, they they are in such a tight frame mm -hmm. of the dance. Mm -hmm. She looks past his ears and didn't at that moment notice, and I think the word still is really important, how still you'd become. Because I think in, to her mind, stillness and silence are very important to a poem and creativity as much as movement. Um, so how still you'd become uh, for that flight to be achieved. Well, when you're in a dance like that, and you're moving really fast, your partner is, is kind of stopped in that that frame that you're seeing when everything else is blurring around you. So that's the second or fourth measure um, when she, when they achieve that kind of zone. Is that what you're saying, Betty, or am I putting I think more? so, that it's a zone. And in, in some poems, she talks about going down into the well of unconsciousness and coming back up. Mm -hmm. In this one, that stillness is in the, the world, as you just pointed out. I used to like to dance when, uh, you know, I've, I've learned how to do a lot of modern dances, but waltzing, uh, you, you don't get a chance to do that much anymore. But I do recall when I was younger, the uh, dancing with someone for the first time in a waltz. And so you're putting your arms around each other, you're figuring out how to move with one another. And I like her initial description, something romantic, but requiring restraint, rise and fall, precise execution as we move. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd not thought of it as painful, but it, it, there was a level of discomfort in it until you began to move together in a, a kind of enjoyable way. I'm probably telling you too much here. <laughs> I'm just trying to visualize. <laughs> <laughs> well, Amory, I thought of Simon Biles too when um, reading this. So I, I think that's really uh, just interesting how she um, she had to withdraw from the Olympics because she was getting twisties, they called it. So she was losing um, perspective of where she was when she was in the air. 
Mm -hmm. um, here's something kind of that's similar where they they're they're able to synchronize and they're able to achieve that zone. But um, as soon as the dance is over, they have to they're brought down to who they are. They 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 lose the the fun. They lose the mimicry, and then they're just they're not dancing anymore. The dance is over. <laughs> I think this poem can parallel the process of choreographing a poem or writing a poem. Hmm. Huh? And I'm Say saying more. that, well, because I'm thinking that when you begin, you often begin with some kind of uh, excitement um, and romantic but you know that you have to have restraint and there is that perfect agony as you're going through it and um, you're bending this way and that and you keep smiling because you know the poem is going to come forth and you achieve some flight but then you get to the end and you're brought down <laughs> that's just how i read it i don't think that was her intended purpose but i enjoyed <laughs> analogizing it in that way. I like that. I like the idea of a dance being a process uh, for other other uh, types of art. I like that. I think the poem is also a study in consciousness. Uh, the middle, you know, after the first sentence, it's only, it's two sentences. And the second sentence begins, and because I was distracted, and then we get all that detail by the effort of keeping my frame just enough to gate, I didn't notice because I was distracted. I didn't notice. <clears throat> and so it's not just a poem about their movements individually and together, but also her awareness of the exhilaration, et cetera. Do you think there's an element of social <clears throat> social commentary in here when she says, um, without this pain and this mimicry, we wouldn't have American smooth? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the sign qua non, <clears throat> the sign qua non, um, what that means. Um, I believe it's Latin for it must be, it must be done, something that must it's be done. It's something that's that absolutely works. necessary. It's essential. Mm-hmm. I love the title. It's just enigmatic enough to claim my interest. American Smooth. Well, I, I, I think it's called American Smooth, but I don't think that confines it to just being an American qualification or right. characteristic, rather. She says up near the top, precise execution as we moved into the next song without stopping. Two chests heaving above a seven league stride, mm -hmm. such perfect agony. One learns to smile through ecstatic mimicry being the scene point of, of American smooth. I don't even know if I agree with all that. And I don't know <laughs> if I know enough to agree or disagree. She's not asking me to, and she doesn't care. But the claims there, how, how do you evaluate them? Uh, except the intensity of her own experience, perhaps. Mm. A lot of it I feel I can share, but yeah. I don't know if I can confirm it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just did a Linda. Uh, American Smooth is a category of dance in American style ballroom competitions. Oh. And the division includes dances known as the Waltz, Tango, Foxtrot, and Viennese Waltz. Oh, good research, Peck. Yeah, the American Smooth <laughs> can best be described as a form of ballroom dancing with an enhanced repertoire of easy to perform yet exciting steps. It incorporates steps from three ballroom disciplines, the waltz, Viennese waltz, and foxtrot. It's as if someone just turned the light on in the room. <laughs> uh -huh. Huh. Ron Leatherborough wishes to withdraw preceding cut. <laughs> <laughs> Accepted. <laughs> yeah, so do I. Um, not a social commentary. Oh, geez. If you are performing in competition with American Smooth, 
Um, it, there are rules around when you can dance separated, when you can touch. Um, three lifts are allowed, but no more than three lifts. And mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, that's on Dances with the Stars. I've seen that when people have violated the lift allowance. Amory, you've just performed Olympic poetry service. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I do believe Rita Dove mentioned that, that it takes a lot of energy for poets to have to explain their word uses, mm -hmm. as well as defend their roles when being chosen. So we're just learning a lot. And thank you, Amory, for... Uh, I can quit for the day. I, uh... <laughs> wow. I did, um, I did look up, uh, for what it's worth, everything but the actual definition of American smooth. The last half of the poem is considered almost like a magical realism. It takes, uh, takes the characters from a spiritual uh, existence into an earth, earthly one. They return back down to earth. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with. I think there can be a trance when you're doing anything that requires a physical coordination, strength, and dexterity, you can enter into a state, a, a trance state, and how much more with a partner? I think that's when uh, I've been trying to, I've been struggling with the, that line, how still you became, or, or how still you'd become. Uh, and I, at first I was alerted, when I first read this, I was alerted by the word still, because I thought maybe he was sickly, or he wasn't following. And, you know, because I know that she, her dance partner is her husband. And I wondered if something was wrong at first. That was my first uh, immediate reaction. Mm. But with this discussion and other research, I think that they were just suddenly so synchronized and on the same frequency um, that she wasn't noticing, you know, they were so in sync. That, that he became still in that respect. What do you, what do you think? <laughs> I think it's becoming awfully close to describing sex. Oh. And Lee. <laughs> we, may, we, may, we may not get to another poem now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Quickly, let's find another poem. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I noticed Amory didn't say anything about a visual. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking Linda's been in the wild city of San Francisco too long. <laughs> I'm not coming home, you thinker. <laughs> Down there, all you crazies. <laughs> That's why I'm bringing you with me next time, Amory. Oh, oh. okay then. <laughs> Well, I think we like this poem. There's a lot of depth to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how do you know it was her husband? Um, from the videos, there's you can uh, YouTube videos of her dancing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you sent, I just didn't look at them, sorry. I did, well, I didn't, uh, I didn't send those specific videos, but um, in the, in, in preparation for today's meetup, but uh, there are videos of her. You just, type in Rita Dove dancing and uh, she dances with her husband, which I would, I think that has to be uh, the most graceful form of marriage counseling. <laughs> <laughs> you should have danced more, some of you. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And working together as a team, you know, there's so many, I can imagine so many positive benefits from being Part, dance partners with, with, with your uh, significant other. <laughs> well, should we look at Exit or Hades Pitch or maybe um, this kind of uh, dark one about uh, Bake? Well, which, exit? which one, Shannon? You name it. Oh, okay. Uh, they're also different. Poor guy, I, I always want to give Beethoven a hug. Whenever I hear about his life being deaf, and I just want to go back in time and give him a big hug. Let's start with Beethoven then. Ludwig von Beethoven's return to Vienna. 
So when my proud city spread her gypsy skirts, I re-entered. She burned a greater constant light. Call me rough, ill-tempered, slovenly. I tell you, every tenderness I have ever known has been nothing but thwarted violence, an ache so permanent and deep. The lightest touch awakens it. It is impossible to care enough. I have returned with a second symphony and 15 piano variations, which I've named Prometheus after the rogue Titan, the half a god who knew the worst sin is to take what cannot be given back. I smile and bow and the world is loud. And though I dare not lean in to shout, can't you see that I'm deaf? I cannot stop listening. Such an amazing ending. Yeah. I love a poem with a good ending. Wow. I'm quite enchanted by the fact that the same person who could write, who did write the bright airiness of American Smooth also wrote this. I think she has a great breadth of history, of knowledge, of life experiences, and of the creative spirit and I, and I do think she's a great reviser. I think she works very hard before the poems go out. Mm -hmm. And I think like Linda, that she's also talking about the art of writing poetry in many of her poems. And I think that happens in this one as well. I mean, I could buy your, uh, your thought in the last one being also about the art of writing. I'm struck by the tensions in her poems. Uh, the joys, the satisfactions, uh, then the pain of moving in the world uh, on so many levels, mm -hmm. and then just all the cross currents and emotions and in psychological impulse as everything about human existence. Mm -hmm. uh, so much pain and yet so much what impulse to keep moving the need to respond mm -hmm. that that phrase I smile and bow <laughs> just what are those gestures intended for? I, we know why a, a, a musician does that, but mm -hmm. why does this musician tell us that, according to Rita Dove? Hmm. I wish I knew more about her um, interest in, comma, love of Beethoven to know why she feels such um, maybe synchronicity with him to imagine what his thoughts might be and what she knows about deafness and musical creation and there's just, there's just a lot, I feel like there's a lot, but she has a lot of background in the topics upon which she touches that I don't, that I don't know about, but it allows her to produce a poem of depth like this. It would be interesting to, for, if we're going to discuss the poem this way, we don't need to, but I can tell you the, the lines that have written what reverberated for me each time I've read it 
I tell you, every tenderness I have ever known has been nothing but thwarted violence, an ache so permanent and deep. The lightest touch awakens it. It is impossible to carry now. Those lines almost exhaust me when mm -hmm. I think in my own role as a teacher and faculty supervisor, the, the lives I've touched and the pain I've seen. Uh, it is impossible to carry enough. What a remarkable straining. This, um, the, the speaker in this poem has lost his hearing, his greatest gift, but not his ability to create great gifts in the symphony and 15 piano variations. So amongst this, I think she's also describing the spirit behind creation and the ability to create great art, even when you lo lose the ability to hear it in your uh, in in the physical world. This Beethoven was still hearing it. Mm -hmm. What he couldn't hear was how well the musicians had done in creating what he can hear in his ears, in his head. That must be mm. incredible. And you'd certainly have to trust your, you, your musicians, first of all, your ability to explain what it should sound like, and then their ability. Um, because of just the happenstance of doing this poem right after he did American Smooth. I'm struck by, by the line I can't find now. Oh, well, the idea of, oh, I smile and bow. Uh, that was key in, in American Smooth. I must smile. That whole, um, I'm, I'm thinking about that, that theme of putting on the right face even though in the dancing, she it was agony because of um, just the difficulty of doing the dance. And here it's agony because he's expected to smile and bow. And I also like the whole um, line and the uh, repetition of sound she gets. And the words are so simple. I smile and bow and the world is loud. Yeah. And I also cannot stop listening. That is such a powerful ending. Mm. I did find that um, this poem came from a, a collection of her poems that are tells the story of a mulatto violin, violinist who met Beethoven. The, it's a collect, the whole book is a collection based on uh, the violinist's perspective. Uh, you know, I think I think one of our issues that we had with Rusk was was placement and where where is this happening? But this with this poem, there's it feels like it's a specific place in time that uh, you can put your finger on. And I I learned that Beethoven was sent to the country to try to cure his deafness. And this is the moment he returns back to his uh, to the audience, so to speak, to the fans. Um, and he comes back with all of this art. You know, he comes back with a second symphony and fifteen piano variations while he's supposedly uh, gaining his hearing back um, out in the country, getting healed of of losing his hearing. And we know it doesn't come back. When you said sent to the country to cure his deafness. Yeah. 
I first heard when he was sent to the country to hear his deafness. Oh, I <laughs> that's, that's what I heard. I think that's what you said, actually. Oh, I thought I heard. And that's, that's actually an interesting thought to ponder. <laughs> I thought so, too. <laughs> I thought Shannon's a damn poet. <laughs> that is more this morning now. <laughs> yeah. To uh, the good air. Yeah, good air. Good good air or there's some magical waters that you could soak in, you know. Uh, like people sent to Arizona to cure their consumption. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I'm a little riveted on the on the um, lines that you excerpt, Ron. I tell you, every tenderness I have ever known has been nothing but thwarted violence, an ache so permanent and deep the slightest touch awakens it. It is impossible to care enough. And I, and I'm wondering where that comes from. Is this just pure empathy that she's talking about because of? Uh, you know, thwarted violence that has been inflicted upon people. I'm, I'm still trying to understand it. Beautiful as I think it is. I sometimes think we try to put biography of poets into this persona in the poem. Yeah. And I'm not sure if that helps us understand it because we are also um, a reader and are, and we, and I believe Rita gives us poems to have us bring ourselves into the poem. Is, does that make sense? That there's the text, there's the, the poem, and there's the reader. And that's, uh, and sometimes biography and wanting to know if it's a meta, um, you know, if it's the poet doing a memoir is taking us out of what the reader's experience brings to the poem. And there's another option too, Betty. I, you know, I really appreciate your comment. Beethoven is Rita Dove's vehicle for exploring uh, a whole set of what layers of experience and feeling uh sentience mm -hmm. you know for uh, this person who is deaf his mm -hmm. uh, the speaker in the poem is so intensely in touch with the world and every time i've reread this as we've been talking i keep thinking of the film amadeus mm. and the strength the the incredible way it showed the passion of having music in your head and being compelled driven insane to get that music out yeah. and um so i i think about that and I think about what that would be is you also knew you were losing your ability to hear. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm so struck by Prometheus who knew the worst sin is to take what cannot be given back, you know, to, to have your hearing taken from you when music is your life it just is, It's a, it's a pain that seems would be unimaginable. Mm -hmm. The only thing I can compare to it is if I were to lose my sight, given mm -hmm. how important reading is to me, and it's yes. nothing given a level of creative genius uh, and for which music was, you know, the vehicle. Mm -hmm. um. You know, we were talking about movies about Beethoven um, or something similar. I really have. It, have okay. you all Immortal Beloved that came out in 1994 where Gary Oldman plays Beethoven? Mm -hmm. I, I strongly recommend that movie. Uh, it is so good. And he. What's captured, it called? Um, Immortal Beloved. 
uh, and it is a it's about a uh, uh, a lawyer who is trying to find Beethoven's immortal beloved because he has left he has willed this person whoever they are um, an inheritance and of course uh, he's looking he's in interviewing various women he, they figure out it is, it is a woman that he's had an affair with the whole movie is where they um, it's mostly uh, flashbacks, but Gary Oldman does such a good job. The movie uh, depicts his deafness being caused by physical violence from his father and um, mm -hmm. that he was uh, smacked in the head, uh, apparently uh, um, enough to where it damaged his hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not a historian, but um, wow. I see Beethoven as a hero in the sense that he he really overcame his uh, this handicap that was it was this, being able to hear was such a skill needed to do his job. He hit it so well, you know, nobody I don't think anyone in this audience who was listening to his symphony, his second symphony was saying, oh, this is crap. You know, some deaf man wrote this. <laughs> He was, he was able to um, kind of, in a sense, fool the, his audience of his um, disability. And I think during his time, he would have been highly criticized if, if it had gotten out, if it was common knowledge. I don't know when it became com common knowledge. Uh, when pe everybody knew that he was deaf, but I think it would have been, um, it would have been a career breaking um, event at that, during that time in that century. Uh, he could hear what he was creating. In his head, he could hear. In his yeah. head, he yeah. was not deaf. Exactly. His, the risk he was taking, the huge risk he was taking, I think was um, whether or not it was being replicated in the way that, that it should be. And that would be so difficult. But I wonder if at that point he cared because he knew that he probably could not, he couldn't hear it. And so therefore he just has to give it up and hope that it's all right because there's no way to test, no way for him to test it. Well, yes, but that's his product. He would care deeply, I would think, what others heard. He would care deeply, but he would also be frustrated and be frustrated with the well, of course, with the fact. And so then how do you, you know, how do you, if you are an artist, deal with that? Some might just say, well, I this is all I can do is hope that it's being translated in the way that I hope. Otherwise, you could drive yourself nuts. Well, the last well, line I in the think poem. He did. The last line in the poem. I also cannot stop listening. I don't think that's an empty sentence. I don't think that she's. Um, I think that that is an active. That is an activity. He is. Uh, he cannot stop listening. It is. He's listening, but in his own way, uh, as you as you said, uh, Amy. Uh, in his mind, he can feel the vibration of the applause, uh, I would imagine. Um, maybe just the electricity in the room, so to speak, uh, listening with his body and uh, with his mind. I bet there are biography, biographies of Beethoven that have taken up this, <laughs> this yeah. question. Yeah. I think, I think there would be one or two. Yeah. <laughs> Oh. So yeah. who looked it up? Do you know what, what Prometheus stole? I didn't look it up. I don't have my second computer with me. <laughs> Prometheus really pissed off Zeus because Prometheus stole fire from the gods and Ooh. gave it to mankind. <laughs> mm -hmm. The rogue titan.